Resonance and vocal acoustics in general seems to be one of those topics that is good at dividing singers and teachers of singing and people who talk about singing. It's, it's, it's kind of like everyone's got their own take on this. And it's very difficult when you read or watch any kind of content that's talking about vocal resonance to walk away with some kind of real understanding of what's going on. Often, what voice educators or people who educate on, maybe they, they claim to be educators in voice science, what they have to say about resonance is maybe sometimes kind of true, but has very little to do with any of the things that they're trying to say about how to sing and why you would want to sing that way. It's kind of like a, it's like a side dish. It's, it's like, it's like, it's like the parsley, you know, that, well, actually I eat the parsley. I like, I like parsley, but a lot of people don't. It's, it's like kale. It's basically resonance is the kale of the salad bar of vocal pedagogy. It's just kind of there as a decoration to make the whole thing feel a little bit more healthy. But nobody's any actually getting any kind of sustenance from that. I've made videos complaining about that, and I've made videos showing that even some of our, well, basically all of the biggest names in classical singing who talk about vocal acoustics are either okay with or are directly peddling pseudoscience. Even, it seems, researchers who should know better tend to stay quiet when their science educator colleagues, who may not be researchers themselves, are selling ways of doing things that ought to be related to some kind of real science about vocal acoustics, but really aren't. It's basically all the stuff that they were taught by their teacher, and then they put that out at the salad bar and they add some resonance on the side. It's a nice little decoration. Well, this series is going to be trying to take us in a different direction. I'm going to be introducing you to a system that's meant to help you use concepts of vocal acoustics in particular, perturbation theory to help give yourself a map of your own vocal tract. So welcome back to New School Singer. And I'm going to be making content that's labeled a little bit better than maybe you're used to. Whenever you see this nice little brain icon here, that means we're going to be talking about knowledge. Whatever it is that's going to be in the video, it's going to be stuff that you can learn. And once you learn it, the knowledge itself is the tool that you can apply. The series is going to be about different ways of visualizing vocal tract resonance. We're going to be using some free apps. Today, we're going to be using something called Pink Trombone. It's a web app, and I'm going to put the link in the video description so that you can follow along as we go. Now, what we're going to cover is something I call acoustic areas of interest. These come from perturbation theory. But the reason for changing the name and calling them acoustic areas of interest is because they're going to apply, be applied to a practical system. We're going to also learn about acoustic addresses versus anatomical addresses. 
that's where the map comes in that we're going to be learning to make. Let me quickly define what I mean by an acoustic address and an anatomical address. An anatomical address is the way you're already probably used to thinking about your vocal tract and the shape of your vocal tract, the position of your vocal tract, and the different elements of your vocal tract, like your tongue, your larynx, your lips, your jaw. And then also the motion of these things. If you're opening or closing your mouth, if you're uh, narrowing or widening something, etc., etc. When we talk about that happening, we tend to use the anatomical address. What I mean by that is we might say, well, the area just behind your teeth, your upper teeth, shall we say, your alveolar ridge. So your alveolar ridge is an anatomical address. It's a location that you can find by using knowledge of your anatomy. An acoustic address is really different. If we take that same alveolar ridge, we can get an acoustic address for it. And we get an acoustic address for it by applying some kind of theory of vocal acoustics. In this case, what I recommend and what we're going to use is called perturbation theory. And perturbation theory divides up the vocal tract by proportion. So like one third of the way, two thirds of the way, the beginning and the end, all have to do with areas of interest or displacement nodes and anti-nodes for the second formant. Now, if we change the shape of the vocal tract in certain ways, some of these acoustic addresses will be the same as the anatomical address, no matter what we do. So for instance, the end of your mouth is always going to be the end of your mouth. It's always going to be the end of the vocal tract, both anatomically and acoustically. But what's going on two thirds of the way and what body parts are actually there two thirds of the way? that can change. Today, we're going to focus more on these areas of interest. Because as you'll see in a bit, the free resources that we're going to use don't always give us all the options that we actually have as vocalists. The one we use today is called pink trombone. Now, actually, I think this is not named quite correctly. You can find the link in the video description to follow along. But if you ask me, a trombone is something that's defined by the way it can change its length. And unfortunately, this model of the vocal track that we have here called pink trombone is not able to change its length. But it can do a whole lot of things that we will be interested in. Now, if we just take a look at this app, and you can load this up. I'll show you the splash screen. When you load it up, it looks like this. Just click on there, and it starts singing to you. If you want to stop this because it's annoying, just click on Always Voice. And that's going to stop. Now that always voice is off, uh, we get sound by, by clicking down below on voice box control. Uh, and if uh, we lift that up, we get a clearer sound. And if we put it down, uh, we get a breathy sound. We also have lips that we can click on to get a quick... Uh, fricative or stop. We can do that at the hard palate. At the soft palate. 
we can move the tongue around. And if we go all the way to the top, we can do all these things that we're used to the voice being able to do with your mouth. So this is more or less a, a, a good representation of the shape of your vocal tract. It's, okay, it's not anatomically correct, but because of the way the acoustics work, it doesn't matter that this isn't exactly the shape of the vocal tract. It's still the same kind of tube. It's a, it's a one quarter length resonator. That means it's a resonating tube that's closed at one end and open at the other. If we get the voice started again here, and we clear that up, give it a little vibrato, we notice that moving the tongue around does more or less the same thing as when, when we move our tongue around. If we get it going again and move the, the mouth, the lips, and we can open the nose, etc., etc. Now, if you have iOS devices, which I don't, that gives you special powers when it comes to this app because with an iOS device you can for instance hold the tongue in a particular location and then click on the hard palette and you can get a lot closer to speech with this. But we're going to use it to to do to learn today and you may you may want to just open it up um by following the link in the video description and then do this with me because it'll probably make more sense that way. And you'll be learning by, you know, pushing and pulling and squeezing things instead of just with theory. So I'm going to start by talking about these areas of interest in general. Now, if we take the whole thing, that's area of interest number one. Now, despite being called pink trombone, this can't change length. Um, and honestly, I think he would have gotten a lot more views so far if he gave this a more appropriate name, like Moist Flesh Tube. I think that Moist Flesh Tube really describes what is essentially a moist flesh tube much better than Pink Trombone, since trombones, you know, are supposed to change shape and this thing isn't changing shape. I'm just going to list the areas of interest and you can watch other videos that I have about perturbation theory if you want to know why they get these names, but let's just get going. We talked about area of interest number one. Now, number two is going to be here at the end. The end of the tube, would we would say, is the strongest part of area of interest number two. And then... As you go towards the center of the vocal tract, the area of interest number two loses influence. And then when we get to the center and we start going the other way, we get to the beginning of the tube, right where the larynx is basically. And this is area of interest number three. And that works like area of interest number two. It loses influence until you get halfway, then we start at area of interest number two. And both of them are extremely weak here in the middle. There's they're all they're very little effect here in the middle. And then as you get to the, the beginning of the vocal tract, area of interest number three has huge influence, and area of interest number two has no influence. Let's look at the next two areas of interest. So we've got number two 
And here we've got number three. Now, if we go one third of the way down the vocal tract, and since this doesn't change length on pink trombone, it's always going to be the same place. So we can say area of interest number two is about here. And we don't have to be completely exact here. Um, in real life, it is more or less exact. Uh, but as you'll see, we're, we're just kind of casually pushing and pulling on things. So it's not a huge deal. And then area of interest number five is going to be about here. Now let's start by messing around and seeing what happens when we either expand or constrict these areas. Now, unfortunately, the mouth, as you can see, we can't expand it further than it is. But if I started with the mouth a little bit closed, which you can with iOS, but I can't on my computer here. So just imagine it's a little bit close. Imagine we start here. And I open it. What would you say about the change in sound that you heard? Would you say that it got lower or higher in terms of the pitch of the timbre, so not the the pitch itself, but the that's coming out as the note that we hear. But what about the, let's say the color of it, or however you want to think of it, the resonance of it. Something gets darker, something gets lower when I constrict this area, and then it gets brighter when I open it back up again. So once more. Now if we do this with area of interest number three, we get really different results. So if uh, it's starting up open in here, and if I go and I make it more narrow, So what can you notice about that? If you ask me, it's having the opposite effect. When I make area of interest number three more narrow, it makes the resonance, shall we say, brighter. We could say twangier. And we could also say higher. It's raising all of the resonances of the vocal tract. And then when I'm doing that to area of interest number two, it's having the opposite effect. It's lowering all of the resonances of the vocal tract. So we could say that area of interest number two it raises when we expand. And we could say that area of interest, number three, it lowers when we expand. So what about area of interest number four? What would you predict is going to happen when I make this more narrow? Now, in case you're getting visually confused here, the pink stuff, the pink parts, with the lines running through it, those are the empty space. Where it says soft palate, hard palate, and lip, that's not the tube. And then where it says nasal cavity here, this is empty space. So this, when I, when I do this with the tongue, you see the pink part, is getting more narrow. So that's that's our tube there. That's our resonator. So if area of interest number two is raising the pitch when I expand it, and area of interest number three 
is lowering the pitch when I expand it and vice versa. Let's find out what happens to area of interest number four. So judging by this, I can say first of all that probably I've got area of interest number four. A little bit too close. A little bit too far down. It's 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 more than one third of the way. So I'm gonna fix this. Not because I'm really good at judging what's one third, but because I can hear what's going on. So we're gonna put area of interest number four around here. That does look a little bit more like one third of the way, I have to say. So getting back to this, uh, let's see, bring this back up here. Okay. So when I'm constricting area of interest number four, things are going down. And when I'm expanding it, things are going up. So let's keep track of things here. We've got area of interest number one bringing things up. Area of interest number three bringing things down when we expand. Now continuing with the expansion theme. Area of interest number four raises things when we expand and it lowers things when we're constricting. Now are you, if you're guessing that area of interest number five will probably Therefore, <laughs> have the opposite effect, you would be correct. So we've got this kind of a sound that comes from constricting area of interest number five. And if you stop and think about it, E is a higher pitched vowel, if you will, than E. And then when we did that with area of interest number four, our E kind of turned to an ah or an uh, and that's lower than E. So we, we you could say we've we've kind of got E in the center of something here, <laughs> and that you can you can go in one direction away from that center and you get towards E kind of sounds and then you go in the other direction and you get towards kind of ah sounds. Uh. So area of interest number five, that's going to be lowering when we expand and raising when we constrict. And we can can say this is expansion and then we could we could just make a separate one for constriction and then we could say AOI2 is going to lower things AOI3 this is going to raise things. AOI4 is going to lower things. And then AOI number five is going to raise things. Okay, so if we wanted to talk about this in terms of performance, now it wouldn't be as easy as saying that the first foreman is affected by, let's say, areas of interest number two and five, and the second foreman is affected by areas of interest number four and three. 
And believe it or not, that's actually like how the the biggest name in classical vocal acoustics is teaching this. He looks at this whole tube here and he thinks, well, this must be actually a bunch of separate tubes. Because if I did have a bunch of separate tubes and I somehow put them together, I would kind of be able to get close to having these first two formants, or maybe the first three. And we're only looking at these first two formants to keep things simple. But if we wanted to keep going and adding resonances, what we would do is we would take F1, and F1 was areas of interest number two and number three. And also area of interest number one is deciding a lot of things kind of beforehand. So that's affecting F1 as well. And if we wanted to talk about F2, we're not looking for just adding or, or we're not looking for just what is left or somewhere else we have to actually take the whole vocal tract so we're actually looking at two three four and five and if we look on the left at our our list of what the different areas of interest do all five of them including number one so but number one works with length and these other ones work with width so it's okay to keep them separate area of interest number two three four and five all affect the second formant if we wanted to get the third formant what would we what we would actually have to do we wouldn't be able to just build on this second formant. So this second formant, we got it by adding another level of division to the vocal track. So it was divided into two parts. You know, when we, when we have number two and number three only, then there's a center point and you know, half of this belongs to number two and the other half belongs to number three, we could say. But when we have areas of interest number four and five added, we divide the vocal tract into three parts. So if, if, we, if we draw lines here, we've got, shall we say, section A, section B, and section C. But if we wanted to get the third resonance of the voice, we'd have to add another division, which means this, if we divide it up into an extra part, that's not going to line up exactly with when we have it divided into three parts. And then if you keep adding formats, some of them, your areas of interest that change the tuning for that formant are gonna look like they kind of overlap or are close together and stuff like that, but it's it's not gonna be as simple as saying, well, the first formant is over here, the second formant is over there, and the second formant, the third formant, fourth formant, whatever, is over there. Everything that's going on, every resonance of the vocal tract uses the whole vocal tract. And next time we're going to talk about Another app you can use that's going to be a lot less user friendly. That one's going to allow us to change area of interest number one. And we're going to use that to learn about this concept of acoustic address because on this uh, moist flesh tube model, the areas of interest don't move, they're fixed, they will always be in the same place. But this is great because it means when you go and you study this and you mess around with it to see how it works and see for yourself and then let's say you keep your vocal tract in a similar kind of length so you, you can see here you would need your larynx to be somewhere below your tongue <laughs> this is for a, a kind of a longer vocal tract setting 
so let's say medium vocal tract length and try not to change that and you should be able to see that your voice works exactly the same way when you constrict area of interest number two something goes down well everything goes down when you constrict area of interest number four something goes down and something stays up you wind up moving the resonances against each other so that you can create some difference between them and you should notice that all of this stuff works in your body exactly like it works right here on this free app and if you're a classical singer I especially invite you to explore area of interest number three because this one gets a bad reputation we're often told that we have to avoid constriction here but if you work out the math for many many singers maybe not all but especially for the male voices shall we say and the altos and probably a lot of mezzo sopranos a lot of the time it's usually a failure to constrict in area of interest number three while doing something else that is tripping people up and if you don't have a good understanding of what you can do with this and what it will do to your resonance then you may not guess that may well maybe I could let's say I'm trying to get this vowel and uh, and I want it to be something like E or E and and it's coming out like like eh. well maybe maybe the solution you're looking for with your tongue would not be necessary if you could just raise the resonance first from area of interest number three maybe then you would be able to constrict area of interest number four a little bit to lower the second formant relative to the first one and get the result you were after and maybe you wouldn't have guessed that without being able to just visualize a really simplified version of your vocal track so next time we're going to look at another app called Vocal Track Lab. That's also going to be free. Um, but as I warned you, a lot less user friendly. I'm going to be making a little bit more content here as we're in the summer season. Uh, and as you can see, I'm, I'm going for a little bit different format. Um, and this should lead to live streams. So let me know in your comments what kind of topics you'd like to see covered um, and whether or not you're you're interested in participating in discussions on on live streams especially um, okay so see ya